Wait, a lack of oxygen isn't the scariest part about space? How dangerous are solar flares? And do we have any real idea where galactic cosmic rays come from? Also, what even is a galactic cosmic ray? It's not at all related to the Death Star, despite what it sounds like. Today, we're going to answer all of these questions and tell you how we design our spacecraft to deal with radiation. So radiation is a really broad term. There's a huge spectrum of different kinds of radiation all around us, all the time. Everything from the microwaves we use to reheat our food to high energy protons, part of medical cancer therapy screenings. Most of the radiation in our lives, we take for granted. So when someone says radiation, they're usually talking about ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation has way more energy than other kinds of radiation. As you can maybe guess, ionizing radiation has enough energy to ionize atoms, meaning it can strip away the electrons that orbit the nucleus. Every material in the universe can withstand a certain amount of ionizing radiation up until things start to change and fall apart. One of the most dangerous things in space for any given spacecraft is the insane amounts of radiation going on in different areas in space. But where does all this radiation come from? The Earth is actually a big ball of spinning molten metal covered by dirt. The spinning metal in the mantle of the Earth turns our planet into a giant magnet, which is also the reason compasses point north. That same magnetic field also captures radiation, specifically in the Van Allen belts. The Van Allen belts are Earth's donut-shaped radiation shield. The inner belt is mainly composed of protons, while the outer belt is mostly electrons, which are both trapped by magnetic fields. They're radiation hot zones. Next, we have solar radiation, electromagnetic energy and highly energetic particles that come from the sun. This can look like brief but very energetic solar flares or massive but slow coronal mass ejections. Both can disrupt Earth's magnetosphere and create geomagnetic storms, and they bring with them a lot of radiation. And last, but not least, our galactic cosmic rays. Huge high energy particles from deep space traveling at 99.99999% the speed of light. They're also incredibly radioactive. And the craziest part, we have no idea where they come from. Some think they come from exploding stars called supernova. Others think they're related to black holes. I think it comes from aliens, but the point is that nobody really knows. So we've got a donut-shaped ocean of radiation around our Earth, random explosions of radiation from the sun, and near light speed particles from unknown origins making space quite the intense environment. What could these different radiation sources actually do to our spacecraft? Spoiler, there's a lot of things it can do. For our first category of radiation effects, we have single event effects. Within this, radiation can hit a computer chip and displace a few electrons, causing a single binary digit to change from a one to a zero or a zero to a one. This even happens on Earth, like in 2003, when a bit flips in a voting machine in Belgium, causing one candidate to suddenly gain 4,096 votes. Transient effects are temporary malfunctions in electronic circuits due to a burst of radiation. This will look like spikes in voltage or in current. Outside of single event effects, there's an effect of inhabiting a high radiation environment for a long period of time that results in the accumulation of radiation. This is referred to as the total ionizing dose. This could make things draw more current, could change how fast things turn on or off, or how slow a computer might operate. Outside of electronics, the total ionizing dose can physically change the properties of materials. For example, over time, glass that's in space will actually go from clear to brown and kind of muddy. And last but not least, there's displacement dose damage. This is caused by very energetic and large mass particles that upon contact with our chips can literally knock an atom off its lattice and cause a defect. Those are the top level ways radiation can impact hardware in space. We're not even gonna try and talk about how radiation affects the human body in space. Let's just say it's not good. Humanity has figured out how to design spacecraft to resist various radiation effects, despite the intensity and regularity of radiation in space. Traditionally, handling radiation in space meant throwing lots of money at the problem by creating every component from the ground up to be ran hard. This process is slow, very expensive, and in many cases, unnecessary. Because this whole radiation process takes a while, by the time you've gotten something rad hardened, there's probably a better, faster component out there that you would rather be using already. Our approach to dealing with radiation at Nostratus looks at fundamentals of the problem and builds off of the backs of all of the missions that have come before us. There really is no one solution to being able to deal with all of these problems in space. Radiation isn't something you can just get away from. Some people might claim our design is 100% radiation hardened and frankly, 
we're skeptical. If somebody's a bigger random galactic portal out there ready to come by and ruin your day. But you have a choice. You can make a gigantic satellite with tons of shielding and protection, or you can accept that sometimes glitches will happen. If you design your system with the eventuality of glitches accounted for to detect and correct them before you even notice, you can start doing some pretty cool things. At Astronus, we take our entire satellite model down to the screws, and we run it through some complicated physics simulations to know exactly how much radiation will get inside the whole spacecraft as particles are traveling through the satellite. Once we've done simulations like these, the first way to stop radiation is by simply blocking it with other atoms, physically putting material in the way. Normally we use aluminum, but you can get fancy and use tantalum to shield entire components or simply put cute little hats on top of chips that need protection. How do you know if a specific chip needs one of these little hats? That's where testing comes in. To test how much dose our parts can withstand, we irradiate them with a radioactive isotope usually cobalt-60. By testing our parts for radiation harness, we can ensure that they survive the mission by shielding them so they won't get too much dose. While doing this, we're doing characterization testing, tracking how parameters shift over time as they're exposed to radiation, and lot acceptance testing, which is single component quality validation. Every time an IC is made, it isn't always made exactly the same, which means its radiation tolerance can differ from part to part. We're here at Texas A&M to test some individual components for our Block 2 spacecraft. Here, we're using large particle accelerators like this one to shoot heavy ions and expose chips to do single event effects testing. If the chips pass the threshold, they're good to be integrated as is into the greater satellite design. We can design surfaces of our spacecraft to be conductive. We can also make sure that our internal structures are grounded or can slowly leak charge so that there are no potential differences. It isn't as easy as just picking conductive materials. We often need to go out of our way to design for spacecraft charging. Thankfully, we can use some more of those complex physics simulations to predict how our spacecraft will charge in our worst case environments. This is one of the least understood things about making spacecraft. The charging environment changes rapidly, in hours or less, and you have to take into account the seasons, time of day, and on and on and on. It makes predicting these effects incredibly difficult. We actually analyze radiation effects for the satellite at the chip level, meaning that we look at every single chip on every circuit in the entire satellite. Now, I don't know what that exact number is, but I can personally tell you that it is a lot. Once we've done all of this testing, we can then take all the data that we collect and analyze all the possible impacts at all levels of the system and the assembly in order to improve the design for reliability. Once all of this design is done, at some point, you just need to launch it and begin comparing your terrestrial predictions with on-orbit realities. One of the exciting things about having spacecraft on orbit now is that we're able to validate all of the calculation, simulation, and testing we did on Earth in space. Once we're on orbit, that's where all of the hard work of radiation effects pays off. All that's left is monitoring the weather up there. Speaking of monitoring the weather, as we're finishing this radiation video, a huge coronal mass ejection hit Earth. But what did it do to our satellite? Nothing. This massive solar event that was felt all the way on Earth had no effect on our spacecraft. Our holistic approach to picking components, testing, and shielding led to a system that gives us the ability to withstand big radiation events like this. There is no one-size-fits-all fix for radiation. It requires a lot of testing, analysis, and really intentional system design to build a spacecraft that can withstand whatever random speed of light particles crash into it from outer space. Thanks for watching. And stay rad.